Well, first we have to understand this. This isn't just any substitute. I can't pay for your sins, you can't pay for mine. In fact, no mere human being can pay for the sins of another because we are all under the same debt. We're all made of the same stuff, okay? A sin nature. You might be better than me, horizontally speaking, but we're all made of the same stuff. So remember, this isn't just performance or behavior problem, it's a being, it's a systemic problem. The problem isn't just what I've done, it's who I am. It's what's inside of me. And so for this reason, this substitute really must be an amazing kind of miraculous substitute that not only pays for my sin, but somehow completely removes it from me and destroys it forever. This miracle requires a kind of spiritual surgery that removes the cancer of sin and creates in me a, a new heart or a new identity, one that isn't sinful in God's eyes. I need a substitute who can change the inside of me from being sinful to being righteous before God. I need a substitute who will die that death that my sin deserves, that sin requires once and for all. I need more than a surface makeover I need a complete spiritual rebuild. Jesus actually calls this rebirth. In John 3, Jesus is approached by a very religious man. He's really a, a good man. He was a man who had spent his entire life doing very good things for God. And Jesus said to him in verse 3, Verily, verily, or truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, unless you have a total, complete spiritual rebirth, unless we can change your spiritual DNA from sinful to righteous, you can never enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, he says in, in uh, chapter three later, marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. Well, when this man was astounded at Jesus' requirement, he asks him, how can a man be born when he is old? And Jesus answered him, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. In other words, your first birth by water was your physical birth, but your second birth is a birth by Spirit, and it must be a spiritual birth. Now, this isn't something you can see with your eyes. It's only something you experience with your heart, okay? It has to do with this idea of a substitute, a miraculous stand-in. The kind of substitute that doesn't just pay a debt, but the kind that completely rebuilds you and me and gives us a new spiritual bloodline. This is the kind of substitute that pays for sin, but also gives me a whole new identity with God, one without sin, one without a debt. So who is this substitute? Well, here's what God says, for when we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's Romans 5. Again, he says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God sums it up in, in, in chapter 5 when he says it this way. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Jesus personally stated, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. He, he said, he is the way. As he was talking to his disciples, he was preparing to go back to heaven. He was preparing a place for them. And during the conversation, one of the disciples said, how do we get to where you're going? Amazingly, this is what Jesus said to him in that chapter. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now that's an exclusive statement. Jesus literally said, if you ever hope to come to God, you must go through me. He didn't say you must go through baptism or through a church or through a pastor or priest or through any other way he said something totally outrageous unless it's true. He said, I'm the only way. He's the only substitute for our sin. You know, many religions have mediators or go-betweens to bring men to God. Some call them priests or bishops. But in the basic intent, it is the idea that 
this man helps bring you to God in some way that you cannot come to him yourself. Again, God speaks out clearly against this and says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. In other words, Jesus is the only mediator you ever need. Hebrews 2, God says it this way, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Yes, God did provide an amazing, miraculous substitute to die my death and yours, to take away our sins, to give us a spiritual rebirth so we could come to him and be accepted by him. Jesus is our substitute, yours and mine. God's answer, yes, you can have a substitute, but this substitute has to be more than just a man the only solution was for God to take on the form of a man and come to earth and live a sinless life and personally die for us. Yes, he says Jesus is God. If you think that's an extreme claim, consider this. First of all, he repeatedly said that he was God. Here's one example. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou then? Show us the Father. That's John 14. Good men or good teachers don't go around claiming that they are God. Secondly, he not only died, but he rose from the dead. All over the world, you can visit the burial places of religious leaders and founders of worldwide religious systems. For every religion but one, true Christianity. When you visit Jesus' tomb, it's wide open and empty. You know, historical fact very much supports the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Consider this. After Jesus died, his followers went back to their old jobs, fishing. They rejected him. Their dream was dead. They weren't uh, the kind of guys who would die for a lie. Just a few days later, something life-changing and miraculous happened. Something explosive happened that caused those guys to leave again their fishing nets for the rest of their lives. And they all died horrible deaths for the message that they preached, that Jesus died and rose again. Now, let me ask you this question. Would you die for what you knew to be a lie? I doubt it. The fact that the disciples died for their message, every one of them, is proof enough that Jesus truly rose from the dead. We know Jesus is God because he's the only man who ever conquered death and proved it undeniably. God says this, but now is Christ risen from the dead, 1 Corinthians 15. You know, thirdly, we know Jesus is God because it's really the only viable option. There are really only three things Jesus could have been. He could have been God in the flesh, he could have been a liar, or he could have been a crazy man. One author put it this way, Lord, liar, or lunatic. He was much too wise in his ministry and too powerful to call him crazy. He couldn't have been lying because, again, his teaching was too true, and his followers all died, and they would have had to known about the gig, Okay. His miracles, his life-changing three-year ministry, his literal resurrection from death all prove that he was God in the flesh. If you refuse to believe that Jesus is God, you have to throw out the entire Bible because this fact is woven like a thread into every page of the Bible. Colossians 1 calls him the image of the invisible God. 1 Timothy 3 clearly states, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest or made known or revealed in the flesh, justified in the spirit and seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, that's you and me, and believed on in the world and received up into glory. Jesus personally fulfilled dozens of Bible prophecies where God promised to send us a savior. These were things completely out of his control, like where and when he would be born, who his parents were, and how he would die. Every single prophecy was fulfilled just as the Bible predicted. 
For thousands of years, God promised to send this substitute. And when he came, he came just as God said he would come. Yes, Jesus is God in the flesh. He came to earth for one reason. It was the only way to rescue us from the ruthless enemy of sin. This enemy had so invaded our world that it was holding us all hostage to condemnation and really all of creation. And God loves us so much that he literally came to earth to rescue us. Let's find out just what he had to go through to carry out this rescue mission. And stay with me because the story is about to get amazing. 